Um, so a little bit about Poland. Um, I wanted to just show you where it is on a map. So I'm going to share my screen again. So this is a Google map of Poland as it, where it sits in Europe and the world. Um, it is bordered by Germany, Czechia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and then this country here is actually Russia. It's a weird little leftover from history, a uh, little piece of Russia uh, right here uh, called Kaliningrad. It used to be part of Prussia, which was basically Germany. Um, and because of the vagaries of history, it's kind of left off on, on its own. Um, not really a place to visit. <laughs> um, so this is Poland. Um, give you a little satellite view. Um, this is where I lived, a city called Poznań. Um, this is the Old Town Square. What do they have a picture of here? Oh yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, that's the Old Town Hall. Very beautiful little place. These are some of the, um, oh, that's a nice picture. Uh, these are some of the um, buildings in Old Town. Um, we zoom out. We can go to one of the more important cities in Poland, which is Krakow or Kraku. As they pronounce it in Polish, Kraków is beautiful. If you ever go to Poland, you've got to go to Krakow. This is called Wawel, which is the castle. Uh, so it's a really beautiful place to visit. Oh, that's a great picture. Wow. This is the outside of it. So it looks just like a medieval castle. Um, this is the Old Town Square. This is the largest medieval square in Europe. Um, it is gigantic. Um, this is just part of it. This is the Cloth Hall. Oh, that's a Cloth Hall at Christmas. That's the outside of the Cloth Hall. Da, 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 da. They don't have a... Anyway, okay. Um, so one other thing I wanted to share with you, um, that I, I think is a bit interesting, um, is a little video. Uh, it's only going to be about five minutes of um, the changing map of Europe, really. But uh, I want us to pay particular attention to Poland. So we're going to go here, make that bigger, and then play it. So if you'll notice, this is 966, the year 966. This is often considered the beginning of Poland. And what that really means is that that was the year Catholicism came to Poland. This is the year that Poland was baptized, right? Which really means that the king of Poland was baptized. Um, and actually, there was no king before that. Um, the king of Hungary, actually, um, with the permission of the pope, obviously, crowned the first king of Poland. Um, and that was, and I'll have some notes here later, uh, the first important uh, dynasty of Polish kings called the Piast, P-I-A-S-T, and I'll, I'll make some notes later. Uh, so 966 is often considered the beginning of Poland, but obviously there were people in this area who called themselves something, you know, Pol, Polania, uh, other you know, Western Slavic tribes who ended up making up Poland. Um, and they'd been there for a long time, but Really, I mean, you know, as far as historians are concerned, it's 966 when Polish history begins. Um, so if you look here, this is a really cool little video because it shows you how fluid national borders were for so long in, uh, in Europe. Um, you see borders constantly changing. The Holy Roman Empire stays pretty pretty stable and then they get bigger and Poland changes its borders a bit. There's some stuff going on historically, uh, struggles between family members, brothers who had been given land and whatnot. That's a whole period it's kind of interesting in Polish history. So Poland is just this little state for quite a while. Um, the Rus, who are actually Vikings, not Slavs. Um, Russians have uh, deep root, historical roots with um, Viking invaders. They actually, that's where Rus comes from. They were a tribe of Vikings. I found that interesting. Poland gets a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller over the years. 
Um, yeah, this is going fast enough. So as it goes on, we get into the uh, 12th, 13th century. Um, right there, the Teutonic Knights. That is going to be a big problem for Poland uh, in history. Um, now, what happens is, is that the Teutons were a um, crusading order that were crusading throughout the Holy Land back when the Crusades were going on. Uh, they were Germanic. It was a, a German order of knights, Christian knights, or Catholic knights. Um, and when the uh, Crusades started winding down, they, you know, their power really started to wane. Um, they didn't have anyone to kill. They had no, um, no uh, um, heretics to kill anymore down here in the Holy Land, uh, actually down here. Um, and so the King of Poland, he was like, hey, I've got this tribe of people up north called Prussians who are, um, who are not Christian. They are, um, oh my gosh, what's the word? Pagans, big, big group of pagan people up here and they won't become Christian. I need help. So why don't you come up and I'll give you a little land and uh, you can, you know, fill them off. And that's what they did. The two towns came up and they completely massacred and wiped out the Prussian people. Uh, and then they actually ended up taking the name Prussian. Uh, and so when you hear Prussia, you know, involved with World War I and whatnot, uh, it's actually just Germany. It's Germans who live in what the Teutons had, the Teutonic Knights had carved out. And they become a big problem for Poland. Uh, and it comes to a head eventually in a big battle in 1410. The Mongols invade. The Mongol Empire is huge. Um, a group of Mongols called the um, the Tatars basically become kind of a find a permanent place in Poland. And even today in Eastern Poland, you can find uh, little communities of Muslims who are descendants of the Mongol invaders. Um, and they, there are um, there are mosques, there's little mosques in Eastern Poland, um, and they trace their roots back to the original Mongols. So you see the Teutonic, yeah, the Teutonics are up here. They're getting bigger, more powerful. Poland is also getting a bit bigger. Poland ends up becoming a very uh, important power in Europe. Um, Lithuania appears on the map for the first time. No, so now you begin to see Poland expanding. Um, Lithuania becomes huge. So Lithuania and Poland eventually um, join together. The king of the a Duke of Lithuania marries uh, the, a queen of Poland, who was actually the last uh, Piast. His name was Jagiełło, and he starts the Jagiellon dynasty. Uh, and so Poland and Lithuania join together to become the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, eventually it just becomes Poland. But if you'll see here, this is basically one state, Poland and Lithuania, stretching all this area here. They even take over Moscow for a little while. So now uh, in the late 15th century, mid 15th century, you have Poland stretching from one sea to another. They have lands on the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea. Um, they, it becomes the largest political entity in Poland, in uh, Europe for quite a long time. Uh, I wanted to go back one year. No, it's all right, let's just, pretend that we're looking at 1492. So I like to ask my students, what happened in 1492? And most Americans will answer, well, let's sail the ocean blue. But something else very important happened in 1492. Spain regained all of its lands from uh, the Muslims. They, they finally kicked out the Muslims after several hundred years of fighting. Uh, the Muslims had had a caliphate here for a long time. Um, and the 
Inquisition becomes a thing in Spain. And the king and queen basically tell everyone who's not Catholic that you can, you can stay if you convert or you can leave. Uh, if you don't convert and you stay, you die, basically. So in 1492, Spain kicked out all the Muslims and they kicked out Jews. Um, and this becomes very important for Polish cultural history. The Jews of Spain and other places begin uh, having to migrate long distance across, across Europe. Very few places were welcoming, but one of the places, well, the most welcoming place they found was Poland. Poland was actually a very, at the time, was a very tolerant place for other religions. Um, it, it was always, it I mean, it was always rather Roman Catholic, but um, they were taller, you know, the, 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 uh, the nobility of Poland, um, one of its values was religious tolerance. Um, and there were actually a lot of nobles of Poland were um, eventually become Protestant um, units and uh, Lutherans even. Um, and Jews begin settling in Poland because it's one of the few places in Europe where they can find a safe place to stay. And um, this becomes very important for Polish cultural history. Um, they, uh, they, they end up setting up uh, large communities. Um, they become, a lot of them become very integrated into Polish culture. They, uh, they, um, um, they, uh, they're, they're given, um, basically little towns, um, that they, you know, that they can, um, stay safe in. Um, and so eventually Jewish culture becomes rather central to Polish culture. And it stays this way for hundreds of years. And it's not until World War II where it really all falls apart. By the time World War II and the Holocaust happen, the largest community of Jews in the world are in Poland. Um, and then within five years, it's all gone. Polish Jewish culture is completely obliterated by fascism. Um, and there, there are a few Jews left in Poland today, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's minuscule compared to what it used to be. Um, and after the war, you know, the communists didn't really make it very welcoming for the Jews who had remained anyway. Um, so I always like to tell my, I, I, I think a, a good, um, metaphor for this is if you think of Poland as a human body, when, when, uh, the Holocaust happens, it's, it, it's like Polish culture lost one of its arms. That's how integral Jewish culture was to Polish culture for a long time. Polish cuisine, Jewish cuisine becomes uh, almost identical. The bagel is created in, in Pol in, by Polish Jews. And then all of a sudden overnight, the bagel disappears from Poland with, you know, with Jews being uh, massacred, uh, being killed off. Um, so it's, if you were to go there today, you wouldn't know, unless you knew the history, you almost would, you wouldn't, you would have almost no idea that Jewish culture was a really important part of Polish culture for a long time. And it's just, it's a tragedy. Uh, I mean, yes, the death itself obviously is a tragedy, but the such a, a loss of, uh, of this central part of a cultural identity, I think is, a, is, is, is also a, just an immense tragedy to, um, to world culture. Um, so we'll go on. So you see the Ottoman Empire begin um, coming in. And then here you see the final um, part of the union between Poland and Lithuania. It becomes a, a complete a unified um, political entity. So 
you'll notice a huge thing just happened here. Um, this is um, one of the invasions of Poland uh, where the, um, the Russian um, Empire, um, mostly Ukrainian Cossacks, uh, rebel against the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. They invade from the east and Poland loses quite a lot of territory, but they win and they regain a ton of it. They even expand. So you'll see that the Ottoman Empire here in Europe begins fading away. And a lot of this is, and I do not have the exact um, date for this, I forgot to write that down, but a lot of this has to do with the failure of the siege of Vienna um, in the 17th century, I believe, sometime in the 1600s. Um, the Ottomans invade uh, and try to take over Vienna, uh, but a, an army led by the King of Poland, Jan III Sobieski, um, wipes them out. And that is the beginning of the end of the Ottomans in Europe. So this is um, an important moment in Polish history. This is the beginning in 1772 is the first of three partitions. The partitions of Poland are very important to know about uh, if you're studying Polish history and culture. Um, the three empires, Prussia, Russia, and Austro-Hungary um, decide that they're just going to take over bits of Poland. And they're able to do this because Poland has been weakened by a couple hundred years of almost nonstop war. Um, but it's also due to um, the way the political system of Poland was set up. Um, they, the nobility had a lot more power than the king. And actually the kings, since the after the Jagiellon dynasty, had been elected. And most, very often, they were elected, uh, they were foreign princes who were elected to be king of Poland. Um, the uh, parliament of Poland, the same, was made up of the Polish nobility. Um, and to be a noble, all you really had to have was a name. If you were historically a noble, and you could be made a noble, obviously, but if you were, if you had the name and it would have been passed down through the family, it didn't matter how little land you had or how poor you were, you were still part of the nobility. You had certain rights, like one of them was you could wear a sword. Also, um, you got to vote in the parliament, the same S-E-J-M, uh, and the nobles elected the kings. Um, one of the, so it almost sounds like a kind of proto-democracy, but, you know, women couldn't vote, the peasants couldn't vote, they were even really considered Polish. Now, the weird thing about this is that 7% of the population was part of the nobility. Uh, let me do a little math here. Um, there are 350 million people in the United States times 0 0.07. That would be like if 24 million people were in Congress in the United States. That's the, that 7% doesn't sound like a lot, but in those terms, it was a huge portion of the population. Um, and most of them were dirt poor. They were broke. Um, and so it was very easy for foreign powers to buy them off. Um, even if you had some land, the uh, foreign power could say, well, here, here's some money. Now you're rich again, but we want your land. And they would take it. They would move into the cities. Uh, so a lot of this was done through buying off impoverished nobles, but a lot of it was done through violence. And this is the first moment of this um, of this uh, of these partitions 1772 actually is the first one and we go on so 1790 is the second partition um russia and russia eat up a bit more land and then 1795 poland is erased from the map and it will not return to the map until uh the end of world war one um 
And so this is where I'm going to stop the video because this is where Poland, where we begin with Poland. Uh, the literature we're studying begins when there is no Poland. And most Polish literature, all Polish literature, well, Polish literature from 1795 until, some would argue until 1989 when the communists um, leave power in Poland, um, Polish literature is the literature of exile. Even if you're in the geographic space of what was Poland, there is no political entity of Poland. It is gone. And so even if you're there in Krakow writing literature in Polish, you're writing it in, uh, in Austria. You're not writing it in Poland. And so this becomes a very important part of Polish identity, these three partitions where Poland uh, you have millions of people who call themselves Polish, who speak the same language, who share the same culture, who um, you know have all these similarities and share these different cultural and ethnic, whatever that means, um, um, elements. But they're not in Poland; they are they are exiled, um, and this this remains an important part of Polish identity. This fact of partition. So we're going to stop that video there. Um, so I want to give you a few dates. So keep this in mind when we start talking about um, when we go to our um, lecture for day one on romanticism, because this is the um, historical uh, moment when this literature is being written. And this has a very important, this plays a very, this historical fact plays a very important role uh, in that, the literature of that time, and, you know, after that as well. Um, so I want to give you a few dates. I'm going to share a whiteboard. So the first date is 966 as the baptism of Poland, baptism. And where a lot, you know, a lot, a lot of people just suggest that's the beginning of Polish history. Um, the first dynasty, first of two most important dynasties, is the Piast dynasty. Dynasty. Um, they ruled from 930 to 1370. Um, the if you're going to know one name in the, of the Piast, it's Kazimierz the Great. Uh, of 1310 to 1370. He was actually the last um, of the Piast. <laughs> um, they say he found Poland made of wood and left it made of brick and stone. So he was a he was a very important, um, very progressive king. Uh, um, he did a lot with um, um, Polish, not, not just Polish uh, uh, infrastructure, but um, he, he, he um, fixed up, there's a better word, he, uh, the financial system. Um, he, he was uh, one of the first kings to invite Jews to live in Poland. He was a very tolerant, religiously tolerant king. Um, there And there's uh, an important district in, in Krakow called uh, Azimiesz, uh, and it was actually the Jewish town um, of Krakow. Um, it was uh, he had given he and there was an area he gave to Jews to set up um, their own uh, community, and that's why they called it, called it Azimiesz, and it's still there today. Um, after the the Piast, you get the Jagiellons. Um, and they ruled from 1386 to 1596, and they get their um, name from Yagi. I'm going to change this to Polish keyboard. Jagiełło, King Jagiełło. He was a Lithuanian duke. He married um, Jadwiga Piast. Uh, she was the last Zion of the Piast dynasty, well-loved. She was beloved um, 
by uh, the polls. Um, and um, she agreed to uh, marry Yegyewo as a way to secure Polish power in the region and whatnot. Um, and this ends up creating this union between Poland and Lithuania creates, as you saw on the map, um, one of the most, one of the largest powers in Europe for hundreds of years. Um, I talked about 1492 already. So after the Jagiellons disappear, Poland starts electing kings. Um, instead of it being dynastic, they elect their kings. Um, sometimes they, uh, um, they're Polish, but not very often. Usually they're actually foreign. So for example, if the first, first elected king of Poland was actually French, he was a French prince. So imagine yourself as a, as a prince, like the third brother uh, of your of the king, of, you know, you're one of the brothers of the king and there's no way you're going to become king because he has kids already. <laughs> and some country says, hey, you could be our king if you like. And he said, well, I mean, what are you going to say? Absolutely. However, the first one, actually, he got very bored with it because the king of Poland was not given very much power. The power laid with the Shlachta. Ah, isn't that a great word? Shlachta. So the Shlachta mean, is just the nobility of Poland. One Shlachta is a Shlachti. And it's called a Shlachti. But Black Pete is just one of these members of the nobility mm -hmm. who end up becoming very, uh, very um, poor. Eventually, they end up becoming broken. They're really the reason that um, that uh, Poland ends up becoming partitioned. And another important little thing to know about what what created the atmosphere, the 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 what created the um, situation that allowed for the weakening of Poland was something called the Liberum Vito. And this, you know, originally, I guess it had um, positive aspects to it, but it just led to Poland becoming a, a backwater. Um, so the Liberum Vito was basically, so every so many years, a same would be called, the parliament would be called. And if you were a noble, you were allowed, you, you could come and vote on things like the king and other stuff. You also vote on taxes, land reform, uh, reform, that was the word I was thinking of. Um, just everything, every, everything about the running of the, of the country. Um, and, you know, this worked quite well for a long time, but there was this little element called the Liberum Vito, and for a long time, it just wasn't used. But what it was, was if, let's say, the same meets for three months, like every few years. Um, <clears throat> at the very end of it, very end of the same at the, you know, like the last day of the meeting, if one noble got up and said, I object, I veto, everything that they had uh, had uh, done until that point was thrown out. Um, so let any laws on land reform, any laws on taxes, any laws on anything, war, um, military, all that stuff was just thrown out and nothing was done. Uh, and so this, this ends up becoming a tool of foreign powers, very Quickly. They figure out, hey, if we buy off some one impoverished noble, he'll stand up and, you know, if, if they're, if uh, these, these uh, nobles want to, you know, make reforms that put us at a disadvantage, like here in Russia, Catherine the Great, and she wants to take over Poland. Um, and they're starting to do some stuff that uh, might help Poland come out of the Dark Ages, pay off a noble and have him stand up and say, uh, I object, and then nothing happens, and it just be it just, it's just. I mean, just talking about it, you can you think, well, that's really stupid, but um, I think it was, it was kind of um, held on to the 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 Shlakta of Poland had the you know they called it their golden freedom, their golden liberty. Um, they held on to as many rights as they had, and the Baron Vito was one of them, and. Um, they just couldn't see that how how much damage it was doing to Poland politically and 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 uh, in Europe and the world stage. So it went on, and that's that sets up the perfect um, atmosphere, the perfect situation for um, 1772, 
1790 and 1795, the three partitions of Poland. And Poland is not on a map anywhere until 1918 again. Um, so <clears throat> those are the important dates up until we uh, we get to our first piece of literature. Um, I